All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for showing up here bright and early this morning. I know it's not the earliest you've been asked to open your minds and pay attention, but we appreciate it intensely. My name is Kevin Cloud, and I'm director of the California Center and Managing Economist here at the Milken Institute. And today we are talking about Hollywood's pursuit of the digital dollar. Why the digital dollar? Because that is not just the future, that is the present. That is shaping how Hollywood is evolving. It's shaping decisions on content, on distribution, on acquisitions, on financing, on pretty much everything. And as such, we are going to discuss not only what's driving people's decisions in terms of what they create, but also what they pursue, what they acquire, and pretty much everything else under the sun. Today, I have a thoroughly distinguished and highly intelligent group of panelists, who I hope will not prove me wrong in that regard. And uh, the panelists that we have today include, going from my far right and your left, Michael Burns, who is vice chairman of Lionsgate. You know that Michael is a success because when he joined Lionsgate, they were a small and uh, nice little independent, and now they're a giant monst monstrous powerhouse with a market cap of nearly $5 billion. He managed to come over from uh, uh, having survived a time as an investment banker, which uh, gives him incredible insights in terms of the finances, but that hasn't stopped him from helping to shape the company and, and to an innovator in the digital space and a leader in creating and licensing content to emerging digital platforms. So Lionsgate is right there at the forefront. And among other properties, they've got Twilight and Hunger Games, which means that uh, if we start to sparkle, he'll kill us. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I fear I have to do something. Right. Like a, it's a vampire joke. I it's a vampire so. joke. <laughs> That's all right. I, I'm, I'm giving one to each person, so you can get, you can groan and then move on. Okay. All right. Kevin Mayer is executive vice president of corporate strategy, a position he prepared diligently for by getting a master's in engineering at MIT. The Harvard MBA may have also helped, but we'll move beyond that. He's managed the acquisitions of Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, Club Penguin, and Maker Studios most recently, and handled the divestitures of Miramax and ABC Radio. This means that he essentially bought our childhood by selling talk radio to somebody else. So, <laughs> exactly. Before Disney, he served as head of LEK's uh, Consulting's global media practice and as Clear Channel Interactive CEO, which also explains why he wanted to get away from radio. Yep. Steven Mnuchin is a man of many talents. Not only did he uh, spend 17 years at Goldman Sachs, where he was actually the firm's chief information officer and a member of their management committee, he is now, not, he is now the chairman of One West Bank Group, uh, the bank holding company. That, uh, in addition, he has been a man who is extremely familiar with sequels because he managed to... Uh, Eight years ago, get into film financing with Dune Entertainment 1, Dune Entertainment 2, and Dune Entertainment 3, which means that he's been a success and he's come back for more. Uh, he's currently uh, just formed a venture to co -finance, uh, called Rat Pack Dune to co-finance a slate of films at Warner Brothers. Uh, he's fin and he's financed films such as Avatar and Life of Pi and more recently Gravity and the Lego Movie, which means that if your model spaceship comes crashing to Earth, he will know how to piece it back together. Ben Silverman is chairman and founder of Electus, a next generation content studio, an Emmy and Golden Globe winning producer, so that means that he's got lots of nice things on his mantle. Uh, he's uh, uh, done, number of, he's uh, done a number of different things. Most recently, he founded, co-founded Electus with, in partnership with Barry Diller's IAC, but in the past, he's done things uh, such as uh, mob wise, he's doing things right now, uh, including uh, mob. He's done mob wise for VH1, King of the Nerds. He did. Uh, he helped to do uh, the U.S. Office, and uh, in particular, what I found fascinating was that he did a combination of The Biggest Loser and The Tudors, which essentially means that the lesson we learn is that the best way to lose weight is to lose your head. <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't been connected that way before, but I like it. <laughs> so. See, I got better as we went along. You did. <laughs> All right. So uh, first thing I would like to start off with is to ask everyone a few different things about how the digital, uh, how the digital environment works. And 
what exactly is driving it. Now, uh, Michael, I'd like to start off by ta asking you is that you've got a, a channel Epics, which has, be, uh, has developed a very successful app uh, for the PlayStation and Xbox. There are a lot of digital boxes out there now, a lot of different choices. Why in particular are the PlayStation Xbox, which we think of as game consoles, so important to a digital future? Well, Epics, uh, you, you mentioned, Kevin, it was our, our version of, uh, obviously, HBO or Showtime. Uh, at the time, Showtime was, uh, we were in the middle of renewing our, our Showtime deal, both MGM, uh, Lionsgate, and uh, Paramount. And so we ultimately decided that we couldn't make that rate card work, what they were offering. So we started our own channel. People thought we were crazy. And uh, maybe we were, but uh, so far so good. What happened is you have the emergence of digital players. Mm -hmm. For example, we have uh, Epic's product that's licensed to both Amazon and Netflix on a non-exclusive basis. Mm -hmm. We've picked up a bunch of MSOs you know, along the way, and we're doing about $100 million in EBITDA, and that's without having DirecTV, mm -hmm. Comcast, Cablevision, AT&T. And my sense is that we'll ultimately get them all. But the, the interesting thing, when you, know, you talk about, there was a lot of press about HBO on, on the go and all that authentication, Epics was very early, actually before HBO on that, and so they made deals with, for example, PlayStation and Xbox. Xbox, they had over a million and a half downloads of the app in the first week, very successful. What, why it's important, I think, is that um, it, content's about an impulse item. It's an impulse item right now. People want to get it when they want to see it. Also, when you take a look at those, at, look at Xboxes and Playstations, it's a younger audience, which I think is important to the industry. So we, um, have the ability to have those players or those people on those those consoles download uh, the Epics app, and it's working. It makes a great deal of sense. Well, that and that brings up uh, the fact that if we're going to talk about uh, reaching an audience, that uh, Ben, when you uh, when you go ahead and decide that you're going to create a property, you go. You one of the key factors for you is pursuing specific talent. How do uh, you choose which talent to pursue for something, especially in the digital age? And how do traditional stars, let alone new stars, play in this digital ecosystem? Well, we've uh, very consciously you know, looked at the digital platform, and specifically YouTube, uh, as a great place to figure out how to build tribes and tap into what was done in uh, the cable television market and going after different niches of the audience and identifying talent can help immediately ground that in something uh, clear and relatable. So we partnered with Sofia Vergara, who's one of the great, uh, you know, talents in the general market Hispanic uh, world, and we built a, a channel called Nueve On with her that currently is existing on YouTube very successfully and ha was initially funded through um, a series of investments by the YouTube Premium channels. And we also did something similar with Eminem around a uh, young male platform called Watch Loud. And Eminem and Sophia both immediately stand for something very specific and bring their tribe and their fans to it. They also are both uh, uniquely very honest with their audience from a social media perspective. And Eminem is one of the biggest um, you know, connected talents in terms of his Facebook, his Twitter, and his, his footprint. And because he doesn't overuse it in t and shell stuff, um, there's a real relationship with his fans. And they turn up around what he's promoting and showing. So that's been amazing. And then we've also made strategic relationships with management companies in Hollywood and have built a big um, partnership with uh, some management companies to expand their talent into the digital world, and now further into Netflix, Amazon, and, and what I consider just other versions of television as well. Well, certainly what we consider to be television uh, from a viewing habit standpoint, I can tell you, is certainly changing. Uh, a few years ago, my kids would turn on, uh, would scramble when they got home from school, and especially if they got done with their homework, and sometimes if I wasn't watching first thing in the morning, and turn on the TV to watch their favorite show and their favorite program. Uh, lately, I will say that they've uh, shown a little diversity. They now want to watch their favorite YouTube channel or favorite YouTube person. Uh, and so, yes, habits are absolutely changing. I don't consider my kids the ideal barometer, but on the other hand, 
they seem to be uh, at least in the middle of the curve on a great deal. Now, speaking of uh, key issues such as uh, uh, YouTube, you've got, uh, Kevin, this one's going to you, which is that uh, what's your primary motivation in acquiring a new studio product here in the digital age? I mean, obviously you got a lot of attention recently on maker studios. So how much does digital distribution factor in? It depends on the acquisition, obviously. Uh, with respect to Maker, that vaulted us from a very minor position on YouTube, which, as you point out, is a place where you know, habits are forming, have formed already. Let's face it, it's not emerging. It's, it's huge at this point. And if you want to reach a younger generation of kids, you need to be have a real presence on, on YouTube. We, the last thing that we want as a creative company and an intellectual property company is a vacuum in any place where there are a lot of eyeballs. So, Make the Maker acquisition was about establishing a more than a foothold, I think, a leading presence on YouTube. And if you think about Maker um, versus Facebook, Facebook is the social graph. Your friends are connecting with each other, and it's a person-to-person -person connection, and that's a great way to, to you know, distribute viral content and make, make content viral and get in front of a lot, lot of eyeballs, whereas YouTube is more of a, an interest graph because your YouTube feed depends, it, it, it feeds you information from what you're, the channels you subscribe to, what those artists are actually doing and looking at and creating. So that's taking your, your interests and propagating that to the audience, more, much more so than Facebook does, which is, a, again, a social graph. And we think they're very complementary. We have a huge presence on Facebook. We needed a huge presence on, on YouTube. And all the things that, that Ben just talked about in terms of finding, uh, you know, finding new talent, Understanding, we have a lot of intellectual property that we haven't yet mined. 8,000 characters at Marvel, 17 or 18,000 characters at Lucas. Using, you know, using uh, YouTube as a, as, a, as a test bed for those is going to be interesting for us. And also, just, there's just a fair amount of economic activity that happens there, and we think it can make, you know, make good money. If you then compare and contrast that to the purchase of Lucas itself or, or Marvel, those, of course, digital distribution matters because those are the, some of the economics are moving to the digital platforms in terms of the movies and the television spinoffs that we can create. But a lot of that, most of those economics were based on very traditional uh, models. Consumer products was a big one, believe it or not. And of course, filmed entertainment, theme parks, and the other traditional, you know, traditional ways that we make money. That was the predominant factor in thinking about those acquisitions. That makes a great deal of sense. And uh, of course, you also have a slightly unique position that you have a much broader ecosystem in some ways than a lot of us uh, would normally think of. Yeah, that helps us, uh, well, acquisitions like, like those are actually more valuable to us than they are to any other company. Now, um, you know, we try not to pay more than we need to, <laughs> but certainly we, we can afford to. If we, if, you know, we can afford a higher price because it is definitely more valuable to us. And we have a lot of business platforms. We can take a hit product like the Avengers and make money in a lot of different ways, I think more so than any of our competitors can, can do. So that uh, uniquely positions us in the M&A field. Right, having, through my kids, having to see the unholy alliance of the Avengers and Club Penguin, I can say that clearly, it, uh, it clearly it's possible. All right, Stephen, now what that actually brings up is the fact that a, what we've been talking about is a lot about this move to digital. And one of the things that, in terms of the business model is that there's been a uh, there's been the stagnation of traditional sales, in absolute terms. But Hollywood is still very profitable. Will this be able to continue? And what is going to make it possible? Sure. Well, what I would say is, um, I, I've been a large investor in traditional large studio films, and when I first started doing this eight years ago there really was not broadband connections to the home or other places or the ubiquitous devices of iPads and everything else. But I did think that connectivity would become faster and faster and that digital would become very important for traditional content and that would make the value of this content go up. And I, I think we've seen that. We've seen that play out. I mean, if you look at today across major, major studio films, um, if you look at it in the US, the digital distribution is about 40% of what we call home entertainment, so it's about 60% still physical. We think that will cross over in the next two years. It's slightly lower internationally, and we think that'll cross over in the next two and a half to three years. So the, the digital distribution, uh, I, I think, is a very valuable part of you know, uh, the, the value of the content. Mm -hmm. That being said, one of the things that, uh, that particularly comes up in that is that when you're determining uh, a property, whether it's a property that you're going to help finance to turn into a movie, uh, a property that you're going to revive, say like Candid Camera, uh, a, or a property that you are going to uh, 
uh, expand into digital and uh, into 20,000 different platforms, you're going to finance and create that. One question for all of you is, how do you assess a property like that? You know, in the old days, there used to be a fairly conventional formula, at least it appeared to be a conventional formula. What kind of factors go in now? And Kevin, you've already alluded to a couple of them, but Michael, for example, uh, you, you know, you've managed to uh, acquire uh, or pursue a couple major, uh, major intellectual properties and turn them into hits, let alone some ones you create on your own. How do you make that decision? Well, the first thing I would say is you have to have a great creative team. And uh, my partner, John Feldheimer, and I, I think John's 61 and I'm 55, so we're not the core demo for going into these movies or these young adult novels. I think I lost my phone. Oh, there it is. Um, I will tell you, we like source material. We have a great uh, staff in development and production. So, for example, uh, Eric Feig took Twilight out of Paramount and because he believed in that. And uh, obviously that turned into a gigantic franchise. Uh, the, uh, Stephanie Meyer has sold over 100 million books. Um, we also, uh, our guys, uh, went after Hunger Games when Hunger Games had sold uh, you know, 250,000 copies. And uh, they thought there was something there. Most of the other studios sort of thought, you know, we can't really get into that. It's kids versus kids. I'm pretty sure Disney wasn't going to buy that one. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, we, uh, our guys saw something that, that, that they thought could be spectacular. Uh, Divergent, the same thing, had not, been, uh, had not sold very many copies of that book when we bought that, that trilogy. We're going to now make it four movies. We like the idea of the movie business is a terribly difficult business as we all know, um, the idea that you can have some sort of built-in audience coming off of source material, I think is incredibly important, and uh, that's what we really focus on. Got it. Ben, do you want to talk about your perspective? Yeah, well, I think uh, one of the things, as you were saying that, Michael, and thinking about how you guys have you know, mastered that birth of those book-to-film franchises, there's also the downside of that creatively, which we encounter and I think has opened up this golden age of television, which Michael's firm also plays in, which is you do find yourself looking at all of these creative properties in a pure business model content concept. And whether it's Kevin's acquisitions of unbelievable franchises, which make unbelievable sense for the business, there's also a little bit of a gap with some of the best creative minds who'd rather talk about somebody taking crystal meth over a serialized group of episodes and build something <laughs> like Breaking Bad or tell the story of Henry VIII but open it up with a blowjob like we did in Tudors. You know, and I think all of those, uh, those kind of opportunities to match the brilliant minds who are in this town to tell stories that they really care about with the brilliant franchises that you can acquire or find so that you can shortcut your way to something that may be more satisfying to the audience is a really you know, intricate process of the packaging that all of us do in putting together the content. And to your first part of the question, the other element of where do you take that? You know, is Divergent a better movie? Is it a better TV show? Is The Shield serve better on ABC at 8 o'clock or serve better in the Avengers movies? And in the case of a classic like Candid Camera, do you just put that on YouTube because there are cameras everywhere now? Do you go out and try and say, we all have cameras on us, now we're living in the world of Candid Camera? Or do you want to elevate that production value so it, it can mirror what's happening in society, but also be able to have the big budget value that allows bigger elements to be produced. And that's something we evaluate on everything we do with all of our creative partners, it, because there are so many choices now, and the right distribution platform and partner will determine as much of the success of the property as the property itself many times. Now, Kevin, uh, since uh, you've got a number of different options basically to choose from, and I know that creates a slightly different metric for you, but when you're taking a look at a property, uh, in particular, do you go through an evaluation process as well, not just in terms of the licensing, but when you, you, now that you've got this, you said this huge library, do you go back and uh, l make a decision on what kind of thing to revive? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think one of the themes that's come up here is you can do all the analysis you want. And, you know, um, ultimately, our business is a creative business, and it's a very difficult process. And what we did is when we bought each of these companies that we bought, we got this suite of intellectual property and characters and franchises and brands, yes, but we also got a creative team, which was 
every bit, if not more, important. And we've been very impressed with the teams that we've acquired. They make choices. We have over a decade um, sort of roadmap now for Marvel as to what films we're going to make, what creative choices we're going to make, how we're going to tie them all together, which Marvel Cinematic Universes we're going to pursue. Um, and that whole creative approach to a, to a cinematic universe, as, a, as an example, was born of you know, Kevin Feige, who's the head of, that, of Marvel Studios. He's a creative executive. And that, those sort of decisions and uh, sort of which properties work and which venue through which distribution mechanism and which format and which media type, those, are, those decisions are best left to our, our creative teams. And they have a creative process which is uh, hard to describe, frankly, and it's very intuitive, <laughs> I think, and it does not yield, it's not an analytical process. It's very, very much the, you know, the right brain. And, um, and that's what we get. I mean, we have great creative teams, and, and that's, again, a, a big factor in these acquisitions, and that's hard to value, but it's, uh, it's, some, it's a process we go through. We, we get to know these executives, we get to understand their capabilities, how they fit with our, within, our, with our, within our system, and whether or not the, the gestalt of what they want to produce fits well with how we can monetize. Right. That's, so, how we, that's how we make those decisions. In some cases, you, you come in with a greater familiarity of a creative team, such as like with, Pix, with Pixar. Yeah, yeah. Pixar was well known to us because we worked with them since their inception, frankly, and we were their distribution partner for forever. Uh, they were well known to us. A lot of them were former Disney guys, and some of them were former Lucas guys, so they, they just, you know, the, the circle closes. Um, we knew them very well. Uh, I would say that we were, uh, and so we knew what we were getting there, and that was not an intellectual property purchase. That was a capability purchase, but the technical capability and a creative capability there. That is a, Pixar is a very unique enterprise in that they, the marriage of technology and creativity is very unique. And creativity drives the technology, not the other way around, and, and the technologists serve the creative uh, enterprise, and it's, it's a very, very unique way of working. We knew what we were getting there much, you know, a bit more so, I'd say, than the creative teams at Marvel and Lucas, we did know pretty well. Uh, Marvel was a pleasant surprise. Uh, we knew we were getting a quality team, but they, were, uh, they performed even better than we ever expected. So the, the analysis we did put against the Marvel acquisition has been vastly exceeded by their creative performance. Great. I think the nice thing, I think you've gone through it, Benny, you've gone through it too, and, and Stephen, probably on the, on the banking side as well, when you, when you do these acquisitions, you end up with a lot of great people because you can, it's survival of the fittest. I know that sounds a little too draconian, but the idea, you know, we've done four or five big deals, not compared to yours, um, but, um, you know, from Summit to Mandate to Trimark to uh, Artisan, and we have people that survived. You know, there was a great creative executive here, there's a great, you know, uh, finance person here, and the idea you can continually uh, upgrade your personnel, because it's all about people. That's what it really comes down to, and it, it, particularly if you get somebody on the creative side that's really passionate about something. Uh, passion goes a long way, particularly in the movie and television business. Now, Stephen, one of the things that you, I mean, you've done is that when you've been doing uh, the financing deals and doing slates with the studios is that you've been presented with a range of properties, and you've uh, approach it from sort of another way, which is risk mitigation. How do you mitigate risk in what is essentially a very risky creative process? And what way, when you're developing these slate of movies to finance, is, what kind of valuation process goes into it? Sure. Well, what I'd say is, first of all, the, again, the studio film business is still a very, very expensive investment. And, you know, I think even the people who are the best of the best, picking any individual film is very, very hard. And what we do is similar to what studios do. It's a diversified bet over content. I mean, I think every once in a while, you know, you look at a franchise that's been developed, and then investing in the ongoing franchise lowers your risk. But even that's not without risk. But, I, you know, I can tell you when we, when we had our investment in Avatar, you know, the day before it came out, Fox was as nervous as we were. The film was way over budget. And uh, it was probably the most expensive film made at the time. We had no idea it was going to do $2.8 billion. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, it is a, it, it's ultimately a talent. I think the, the intellectual property is worth a lot. Um, uh, but I, I think it's also you've got to make a diversified bet. The thing that I'm fascinated by, and again, I, I've been mostly involved in digital through the investment in traditional media, and the traditional film business, you know, it's, it's hard not to do big films through studios given the size of the investment and the distribution. What I'm fascinated by digital is all of a sudden you can create good content for a lot less money, whether it's the 
production of, of it using digital equipment or whether it's the distribution through a YouTube, I mean, I, I think there is, I mean, it's already growing. I think the, the growth of this is, is gonna be a huge opportunity as we see more and more people create content and more and more ways of monetizing it. That brings up actually really a, 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 a question that a lot of people have been asking lately. Uh, one of the stories recently came out was that when HBO and uh, Netflix reported the results last time around, there is a sense that Netflix has eclipsed HBO in terms of subscribers, but HBO is still making a lot more money. So the question that immediately comes up is, who's more important right now in terms of the distribution platform, and is that changing? Well, I, 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 I'd answer the question a little bit differently, and then I'll let other people comment on yours. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, Amazon's a great business, and Walmart's a great business. I mean, HBO is a fabulous business, and Netflix, what they've created, is pretty incredible with the breadth of what they have. I mean, I, I think if most people were betting, one business is going to have the EBITDA attacked, and it's going to be harder to maintain. The business that has a billion dollars and the business that has around 100 million ha has a lot of growth. But uh, you know, they're, they're both they're, they're different models, although they overlap in certain ways. But again, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, who would have thought we'd see people like Netflix um, spending the amount of money they are in original content? And you know, I think they've said publicly they want to get to 20% of their spend on original content. That, that, that's a lot of content. Yeah, and that, 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 that'll bring up another question in a minute. But Ben, do you, do you have any thoughts, especially since you're making decisions on where your content's going to go and what kind of deals you make? Well, Netflix arrival created a huge uh, secondary market for our television shows. And I remember with the launch of Hulu that Office, which is a show I exec produced, was one of the you know, first titles to really drive Hulu. I wish that Netflix had been around then because we would have monetized it you know, much greater than we did through Hulu. I'll let Kevin, who's a <laughs> owner of it, discuss its economics. But, um, and where uh, there's great opportunity as a first run content producer at Netflix because they're gonna shift from 95% acquisition to 20% uh, original, you know, to 80% to 20% original, there is a real concern about the cannibalization of the back ends of the television shows because most of Beverly Hills was built on the back ends of television shows and movies. And there is concern as everyone moves into this uh, originals only exclusive content walled world where will the big financial upsides be? And instead, will it be a lower margined business of just you know, small fees and uh, small participations versus what is the opportunity in starting something on a broadcast channel and then selling that on to cable, then selling it on to broadcast syndication, then selling it on to Netflix, doing it non-exclusively with Amazon as well like you've done with Epix, then finding a new person to come in. And actually, we can also put it on Hulu because theirs is an ad play. They're not as competitive. So that's where the, the real dollars come from, and everyone thought that that was going to get cannibalized sooner, and I think we've been pleasantly surprised that there, there's new buyers of the library content as well coming in, and that's really important for the business, almost more so than the explosion of new original opportunities. Michael, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of your decisions? I think that as a content creator and distributor, the more the merrier. Mm -hmm. But I think Benny's got a point is that you got to be careful that you don't eat your own children. So, but again, if you take a look at, just take a look, take a look what's happening around the world. We were, uh, you know, Sky was basically a monopoly for the pay television window in the UK. They had deals with all the major studios and they frankly treated us like re uh, the redheaded stepchild. They'd buy what they wanted, they'd pay whatever they want. It was horrible. Cut to Amazon comes in, buys Love Film. Netflix comes in and now there's a bidding war for our product in the UK and now it's a much more profitable territory for us. And so I think those type of emergences, those type of digital players are emerging uh, uh, everywhere. You take a look at what we, our total business out of a place like China, 
in India, I think we did, I don't know, four or five years ago, we did a total of $300,000 in revenue. I see you're making a little investment in China. <laughs> but the, uh, we did three or $400,000, and all of a sudden we come in, uh, we go to a digital player in China, and they buy the over-the-top rights to Orange is the New Black, which is our new show on Netflix. And now we've created more revenue out of that one show, over the top, than we did total in the territory three or four years ago, and what's that, three billion people. So we think there's a lot of growth there. But I think that the, uh, yeah, we've got to be careful. We're, we're trying to sort of slice and dice it so there is, in fact, a back end besides distribution fees. We have a show with Disney, uh, Nashville, and we've done the first syndication window, actually, uh, with Hulu. So, and if you take a look at why Mad Men is such an incredibly profitable show to us, is because of what Netflix paid, paid for the exclusive syndication window uh, for each one of those episodes. But again, got to pay attention to it, but I think that you're going to see the industry, I think if we get smart, we're going to have shorter windows. We're going to be much bigger players in a non-exclusive uh, space because gosh knows, nobody knows who's going to come out. It just seems like another, every day there's another big player with deep pockets that's coming into the space, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the wild west at the moment. Do you have any thoughts on that, Kevin? Other than I basically agree with the notion that uh, more platforms have usually, um, I think in every instance for Hollywood have added. Um, they've all been, well, not, maybe not fully incremental. There is some cannibalization effect. I mean, you talk about Netflix as a syndication, as the first syndication window that used to be basic cable network. So has there been some replacement of what would have otherwise been a, a cable syndication? Probably, but I think net net, we're finding that there's growth in the market. We at Disney feel strongly, as it sounds like our, our whole panel does, that uh, these burgeoning di digital businesses help. They're friends, they're not foes, and the more we can, and the, the basic underlying fact is that the more you offer consumers what they want, if, you can, if they can consume content at the place of their choosing, at the time of their choosing, with different varying price models, as, as Steve pointed out, and if you can serve them better, they will consume more. And I think that's the underlying good news about all, this whole digital explosion that we've seen is incremental usage occasions and in incremental fundamental real economics for our industry. And I think that is what you see every time a new technology that serves consumers is introduced. Well, you managed to bring it, actually it, two completely independent things I'd love to get back to, but the first one I, is one that I think actually a lot of consumers are really worried about which is that with all these new technologies, there's a real fracturing going on in terms of some of the digital standards and there's some exclusive digital platforms and we're losing to some degree this sense of universality. It may have been an illusion, but we, there's a sense that if you had a DVD, it played pretty much anywhere. People forget the, the DivX fight, people forget some of the, uh, uh, the issues that might have gone on early on in, in cable in terms of whether or not a cable company carried a channel or not. We actually assume that that's going to happen now, whether or not it does. How is that fracturing affecting the consumer, and what kind of dangers does that create, and is it a short-term issue or a long-term one? Uh, I think it's absolutely a short-term issue. Uh, consumers will always win. <laughs> that is a fundamental law of physics almost, and uh, that's what's going to happen. Uh, I think that we had format wars that, were, that almost occurred and did occur in some instances. Um, they always get resolved because that's, because again, I think the fundamental premise, when you, can, when you serve consumers well, that's where, you, that's where economics are created. That's where fundamental, true uh, economic opportunity is. So we believe that. I know that our, everyone in our industry believes that. And I don't believe that there will be any long-term interoperability problems because they, they'll get resolved in the marketplace, as they always do. The, the only thing I would add to that is I'm... Uh, I, I think MFNs in the business, you know, most favored nation deals, I think they're horrible for the consumer. I think it's the reason that you can't, if you're a direct TV subscriber in Los Angeles, you can't get the Pac-12 network. Because what happens is when you're launching a network, you typically make a better deal for the, to, the, to the first guy that steps up and says, all right, we're going to carry your, your channel or your network. And then what happens is... You know, they, they're asking for these MFNs. MFNs are out there. All these, you have consolidation taking place in the industry so that now you have all these major players that are all demanding these MFNs. And ultimately, I think the consumer gets screwed. So I think they, gotta go, they have to go away. Why can't we as content guys, or for that matter, channel owners, why can't we negotiate independently with all of these players? It makes no sense to me. And, and by the way, as the consolidation in the industry keeps happening, 
uh, there, there, there's going to be more power concentrated on these type of deals, and you're going to end up having the, the independence or the consumer choice. It's going to be limited, and I think it's, a, I think it's got to go away. All right, so Ben, has that affected you in any way? Absolutely. I mean, the independent sector is a shrinking sector. And although there are new iterations, they tend to, in success, get acquired by, by the, uh, the established sector. And um, there's no question, in the UK, there is a packed system, a producer's system that lobbied the government, and there's a 25% quota of all the content produced for television in the UK runs through independent production companies who, via the UK charter that governs that, also retain their rights. Um, in today's NBC, Universal, Comcast, Time Warner uh, landscape, they control the rights, and they exploit the rights, and they typically feed from themselves in terms of what content is greenlit or acquired. So you're not only losing the opportunity to ensure an entrepreneurial independent sector that can create wealth, jobs, and opportunity as it did in the UK and drove the alternative investment market there, the, one of the public exchanges. But you also end up losing a little bit potentially of new voices and alternative voices. And with uh, the merger of NBC Universal and Comcast, there was some acknowledgement of that and a couple of channels were force funded by Comcast to appease certain groups including Hispanics with El Rey and African Americans with Revolt. And I think that should be expanded across uh, this newly consolidated business. And as a little guy who like tries to play in the margins of these big companies, it's really hard to be able to compete with their own in-house content as well as potentially be able to exploit the content purely for the consumer and its value versus the agenda of the established entity. Now, uh, Kevin, when you've got, with Disney, you're not, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you don't apparently own any broad, uh, particular broadband access, but uh, you do certainly have a certain set of chains in terms of being able to distribute things out. Does that make a difference in some ways in terms of how you, the, uh, uh, best way of putting it is that in terms of you making a decision on uh, uh, looking at how the content's going out, do you feel like having a stake in Hulu gives you any more leverage? Having, a, you know, having, I can't say necessarily the Disney Channel is, is, is quite the same thing, but you've, you've had stakes in various other distribution arms. Does that give you uh, an, any advantage or is that uh, not well, really enter the, your metric? Uh, you know, we did make an investment, a substantial investment in Hulu, and we decided not to sell it last summer when we were contemplating doing so because we collectively, the owners, decided that uh, it's better to have such an asset, and it gives us a seat at the table. We learn a lot. We uh, have a, a hand in creating the business models, or at least uh, influencing them to some degree. So, you know, I, leverage is an interesting word. I think it gives us insight and it gives us a, a, a position that, a, a privileged position, which is nice to have in the digital world, for sure. Um, you know, uh, we have other assets which, you know, are digital in their nature, too. If you look at TV everywhere, one of the things that we applaud the cable industry for pursuing, uh, we think that uh, putting, again, putting in consumers' hands the ability to get what they've paid for once, wherever they are, through, the, through broadband infrastructure, to mobile devices and to computers and the like, is, is a, through, through game consoles and connected televisions, uh, we think it's an important uh, asset to, to offer to consumers. So again, I think it's a suite of, uh, we want to be present in the full suite of ways that consumers want to touch our content. And Hulu is one of them. Uh, cable, you know, pay television is another one. Free television is one. Um, you know, we like to distribute through Netflix. It's a, we like the whole suite of, of ways to reach the consumer and where we want to participate as an owner, we do. And where we want to be a supplier, that also is a, is a good place to be in many instances. So we like, our, we like the way we're positioned now. We like our, we like our hand. Well, I think a lot of other people like your hand also, <laughs> so hopefully that's a good sign. All right, now Michael, since one of the things that you've been doing is uh, innovating in terms of looking at the way you, uh, digital content, uh, Kevin brought up this idea of, of TV Anywhere and of the idea that you can take, uh, and in particular, is that if you buy content, you're now looking at 
watching it on a portable screen, watching it on your computer while people still have their computers, uh, which is an odd thing to say, uh, watching it on a TV screen, watching it on a, uh, on a tablet, watching it however, how, does it, how is that changing things and how does it affect some of the decisions you're making when you think about that? Yeah, I think we were talking about it a little bit. Of, um, what's happened is content is an impulse item. It never used to be because it's everywhere. Um, I do think, you know, whether it's VOD or whether it's pay-per-view, it's interesting, what I, I, was, I have Fios at home, and, I, uh, and I've been talking about this for a long time, and I, they're the first people that I've seen that, that have done it, which is, you know, you, you rent a movie, you rent a Disney movie, or, and then, you know, you, uh, your kids like it, and then, then you rent it three times, and you're saying, God, why didn't I buy that movie? <laughs> and then they want to see it another time, but I, I was watching something the other day, a movie, uh, for the kids, and all of a sudden it came up when I hit pause, it came up and said, you can buy this movie and get the credit for the rental price. And so then I immediately I turn to my kids and I say, hey, do you guys really like this? How much do you really like? <laughs> and so and I think that, uh, again, the, the idea that you can, you can get it for the right price in any of these formats. I was also going to say that the other thing that everybody should pay attention to is the VOD uh, marketplace, which has turned into a big business. Again, there's an issue with MFNs. Why can I not make a deal? with if all of a sudden it's snowing on the, on the East Coast. Why can I not say, you know, there are people gonna be in their houses this weekend, they're, they're trapped. Uh, let's give a better deal to the East Coast MSOs so that somebody can buy that to you know, basically lower prices and drive demand. The problem, it has to kick in across the country with everybody else that we've made a deal with, that all these deals that have these MFNs. And ironically, a lot of the VOD is controlled by in demand. Who owns in demand? cable operators. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> Intentionally. All right. Well, Stephen, your thoughts, because uh, I know you've got some key uh, some opinions in terms of this, this TV watching everywhere, is that how do you feel that it's affecting things in terms of decision making? Well, all I can tell you is I have a 10-year-old twins and a 12-year-old, and uh, they, they live on TV anywhere. I mean, for the kids' generation, there's no difference between a computer, an iPad, and a television. And, uh, and by the way, I'd say if, if, of all those devices, they probably spend less time in front of the television. Um, and you know, I even find myself now, the way I watch TV is completely different. So I, I think the pie is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, I, I think that you know, as there's more demand for content, and I mean, and then on on the other extreme, and again, this is a this is a super rich product for the moment, but the price will come down. You know, you can put a home theater in your home. You could become a mini theater, and I think for $5,000 a year, with the appropriate equipment, you know, you can get 10 movies the day they come out. Now, obviously, the market for people who are going to pay $500 a film is pretty small. But I do think, kind of, as we see the as we see the windows cut down, and I think you know, for a long time, people thought nobody was going to go to theaters anymore. I mean, I remember this goes back to the creation of HBO, and the answer is, there's people who like to see things in the theater. There's people who like to see things at home, and I think as the windows can be cut down, and all of a sudden there's different price points. Again, I do think the monetization of the content become more and more and more. I think kind of the windows that we have now uh, are really arbitrary and historical. Are we all coming over to Steve's house tomorrow? For, uh... I, 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 by, by, by the way, I, I wouldn't buy it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm still on uh, the, the, the rentals. I must say I'm like you, though. I, I don't end up buying all these things because my kids watch them so many times. Yeah, hey, Particularly you know, I, I, I the Disney funny. things. We were talking about YouTube before. I have a, my oldest is seven, and I have a, a one-year-old and a five-year-old. My seven-year-old, his favorite thing to watch is there's, I don't even know who the guy is, there's some British guy that basically is walking through plain clash of clans. Okay, it's basically him talking about this and whatever happens to oh, me. Yes. And, and he is mesmerized by that because that's his favorite game. And at you just, it's like, you could care less. He's, he's like, that's what I want to watch. Yeah, the the uh, the let's play videos are this whole creature that's a, that the kids seem to be getting into, and you're looking at it and saying, well, "Why aren't you actually playing the game?" And the answer seems to be because it's part of it is it's funnier to see these other people mess up, so you don't have to. 
Well, it's also nice when you have a five and a seven-year-old that it can actually have two different iPads and they're on the same team. And then all of a sudden, the five-year-old turns to the seven-year-old and said, why did you burn down my house? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'd like to hear the answer, too. Yeah, well, there's something to be said for that. Now, ben, you were, you were bringing something up? Um, no, just I think as I was just listening to Kevin talk about the TV everywhere and some of those things and having two very recent experiences supplying ABC and one supplying CW and back to my little independent rant, you know, the, the ABC, um, as we were getting into the final moves on the deal, took control of all of our domestic rights to service their, you know, their other deals and to control the back ends on behalf of us as participants and the various creative people. So I would be curious, Kevin, on the supply side, if you're supplying somebody like CBS versus somebody that, that you own like ABC, would you take two different points of view on how you would grant those rights versus how you would choose to own and exploit those rights? And I honestly tell you, I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, that's uh, our TV business, business affairs group that does that. I'm not sure what our, what our stance is and, and who owns the rights in each instance. But it's, a, it's an interesting question because clearly we're on two sides of that. On the, on the network side, we want to own, we're buying shows. We think that it makes the most sense to offer, to make sure that those are available to consumers when they're watching you know, through, on the internet. I think it totally it makes sense to do that. And we're supplying shows, those economics uh, would be, you know, I guess we'd try to hold on to them. I'm not sure how, how it all works out each time. It is reinventing the wheel because we, we have Hulu, we have a show called Deadbeat and uh, doing pretty well. And, uh, you know, the first deal, I mean, it was grueling about sort of because you're really sort of explaining all these windows to a new player and who says, well, I want this. And you say, you can't have this because you have to have a back end on this. It's, uh, you need a slide ruler on some of these yeah. negotiations. One thing that does bring up is that, uh, just touching back, is when you have TV anywhere and you're distributing content in all these new ways, one of the real dilemmas is protecting the IP. Uh, and there's a f split that goes on between how onerous the protections are and the, how it affects the consumer and making sure that uh, you're able to not lose control of it. And you know, I'm not, not even in terms of piracy, but just simply in terms of making a decision, okay, I've got a, pro I've got a show you know, how many times can it get watched? How many platforms can it get watched on? What time of decision goes in, uh, decision making goes in there? And it, does that change when you're overseas? I think that's a multifaceted question. I mean, I think if you take a look at, I mean, it's ridiculous that this country is so far behind in broadband. Yes. It, it makes no sense to me. And then you have a, you have a and, but, but again, I can argue the other, other side of it. I, I think that, that that if you take a look at Spain, which has enormous broadband, broad, broadband penetration, and frankly, it had enormous piracy, also has enormous unemployment at the moment, um, but it was a, everybody sort of looked the other way. They were focusing on broadband penetration and whether ultimately Spain's gonna turn into a great market, I don't know, we'll see, but they certainly have the broadband penetration. Yeah, but you're looking at every one of those factors, you're trying to figure out, again, you're trying to figure out how to, to, to keep yourself flexible enough in all these different ways on the digital front because, I mean, read some of these contracts when you're, you're making these deals, you know, it's in perpetuity, this is the first proposal, of course, it's in perpetuity on every known device <laughs> or format that ever be considered or even, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And so us as a, but, but again, you know this, Benny, you've got to have, you, if you only have one bidder for your, for your piece of intellectual property, you're dead. Okay, but you have to have two or three players in this space, and now it's nice because now when you have a, a show like Orange is the New Black, you have your hit list of places that you're gonna go, and you say, this is why we think we should take Genji Cohen and Netflix, and you say to, the, you say to Netflix, we think this is a great one-hour drama, uh, or dramedy, or whatever you wanna call it. I guess prison <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that funny, but um, you, you, say, uh, you say, okay, you're our first meeting, and by the way, we're going to NBC after this, and, uh, and otherwise, if, if you don't have competition, you're gonna get killed. <laughs> killed. The nice thing about something like Nashville is that if you, your partner, which they are, we are on, with Disney, we're all in the same boat. And if it doesn't work out, obviously you've got a built-in soundtrack for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's working out so far. Uh, now, uh, 
One question for you, Ben, uh, just following up on that, in the interim, and then Stephen, I've got one going back to an earlier comment that was made. Uh, for you, Ben, when, what kind of position does that put you in when you're clearly more of an independent? And yes, you've also played in, uh, you, you did your, your time in the, uh, in the corporate space as well. In terms of the decision making, when you're bidding on something, or, uh, or rather, both bidding on something as well as trying to get something bought, how is that affecting you, uh, especially in terms of the... Uh, Michael is totally right in that description because what used to be something that you could call a specific buyer and say, I'm, you could do what Michael did around we're going to call you and bring you this show because we think it's perfect for you and our, our creative team wants to um, work in your environment and deliver it for you, but we're just telling you in doing that, you've got to treat us like we had gone to the open market. And even three or four years ago, that was respected and that was appreciated. And if they liked the idea and wanted the idea, they would make their best of market deal with you that you, you had established with them. Now you have to add the, or we're really going to go across the street. And it's not until you're willing to blink enough times and go across the street that you are able to actually get the same deal that you wanted to the first time when you called them up with the first call and designed the content to be on their platform. And that just creates a lot of animus. I mean, that's just more about um, the way the negotiations work and the way that the, the phones get thrown and hung up and, and you're yelled at by people. But the other part in our passion-led creative business is we respond to passion too. And one of the best ways to see somebody's passion is how many episodes? How are the rights going to be divided? Where is the exploitation of this going to live? Who's going to control that exploitation? How are we going to account for it? And those conversations are a good declaration of somebody's passion and desire to be in business with you on the supply side. And on the buy side, we get leveraged a lot as well in those competitive situations when we're making deal with big talent. We have a big television show with The Rock, who's the star of the show called Wake Up Call coming on a Turner in the fall. And we made a deal with The Rock that is consistent with who The Rock is. And that was something that didn't conform to our other deals, but there's only one Rock. <laughs> <laughs> now, Stephen, that leads back indirectly to something uh, that uh, I thought when we chatted previously is very fascinating, which is that the financing model for a lot of this content is really changing. That uh, in this digital world with these alternate, uh, well, as long as they play out, these alternate uh, channels of distribution, uh, how you make a decision in terms of financing content compared to the way the old way that TV was done and sort of this new way for not just TV for, but for movies the, the, uh, that system is changing. How exactly is that changing and what kind of options does it open up? Sure, well, I've, I've never been involved in financing the TV business and, and the reason for that is, you know, the film business is basically a business where you make a bunch of films, you, you hope you never lose a lot of money on a film, you know, uh, every once in a while you do, but, you know, it, it's more of more times at bat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say, that that's the, that's the 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 film business. If if you look at the TV business, and you know your your comment earlier about you know all, all these people who got super wealthy in Beverly Hills, I mean it worked both ways. I mean the TV business used to be, you know, you made a hundred uh, things, and and one thing ended up being the thing that ended up going to syndication. And for the people who were involved in syndication, it was the super most profitable thing that could ever possibly be involved in any any type of content. So you know what I would say is, you probably had less people who made a, a lot of money. I mean, one of the problems for me is when I you know four or five years ago I started looking at financing TV, it was very hard to compete with the studios because of the deficit funding. And you know you were going into things and you knew you were going to lose a lot of money on most of the things and hoping to make a lot of money on, 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 on one or two down the road. That's not a good model for financial people. <laughs> um, I, I do think you know, the flip side of what's gone on in TV is you've created the opportunity for a lot more people to make a lot more content. 
And you know, all of a sudden, you, you can make things without having a huge deficit up front between you know, the, the rights you're going to sell it at, where you can sell a whole season, and the international value. So again, I, I would just say I, I think it's actually a healthier model for television production longer term. Well, one of the main elements of that is this straight to series model. Because when you look at pilots as a <clears throat> financer, it's really a hard one to evaluate because the pilots potentially never reach air and have zero against them in terms of monetization. Whereas what we're seeing with a lot of these news players is this aggressive straight to series model, whether it's History Channel or Netflix. And that's been an incredible uh, compression of time in terms of when you can recoup money and get value back because you know those episodes are going to air, you know that those international receipts are going to be clicked in based on them airing, and you've just suddenly eliminated the single biggest risk along the whole chain, which is the development and pilot process, which is the one that abs absolutely can end up with a, a zero against it. We've, uh, we've had some success with our 1090 model, and uh, what that really what it works out to is you shoot a pilot, uh, then you get a, a commit, or you get a pilot commitment and then you shoot 10 episodes and you make a deal with the network. We've done a couple with FX and a couple around, um, where if the show does a certain ratings hurdle, they're obligated to buy another 90 episodes. We're delivering them for a much smaller license fee, but immediately you're going into a syndicated model where you have 100 episodes. And assuming Charlie Sheen survives, we'll be on episode 100 on the, on the anger management in about uh, after 25 episodes. But the, the network television business, I mean, we have plenty of capital. I think we have, I don't know, access to over a billion dollars of capital right now. But the network business, terrible business. Because a show like Nashville, which we're partners on, you know, we're, the worst thing that can happen is you have a show that goes two years and out, and you've been you know, funding half the deficit, which is not giant on, on, on uh, Nashville. I don't know. I think our, our commitment's about $8 million on our half. But then the show gets you know, three years canceled. Guess what? You lost $24 million. Now, that show, as we talked about before, now it's been sold to Hulu uh, for a pre-syndication window. And, and if it goes four or five years, you can make real money. It's a good instance where digital has changed the model in some instances. We did a uh, pretty substantial deal with Netflix for a Marvel, for Mar uh, Marvel, uh, it was more than one series, it was five series, uh, you know, more than 60 episodes and a culmination of bringing them all together like we did with Avengers with these, with these, uh, with these characters on television. And prior to this digital SVOD model uh, arising, you couldn't have done that. Yeah. It'd be almost impossible because networks don't want to buy, wouldn't commit to buying that many shares up front, sight unseen. Um, and the deficit financing would be, would be substantial. And there really isn't much deficit financing in this model, and we get the creative flexibility to know in advance we're gonna do you know, this many shows. They will be launched on Netflix, and the downstream syndication from Netflix is a little uncertain. It's a new model, don't know how it'll sell internationally. We made, we made some, you know, some assessments of that, but it did give us some more creative freedom. So it's another example of you know, a digital uh, manifestation of this business has really helped us. Uh, and, and, and it's given us an opportunity on the Marvel side we simply would not have had otherwise in the traditional models. So. One thing that actually that brings up for both TV and movies is that we're very, very attached to, a, a, at least historically, to a certain amount of predictability on when things come out. Uh, that uh, with TV shows, the, the idea, with, especially with the network model, is they come out in the fall, they go on for a certain length of time, they uh, might disappear for a short hiatus, they come back, finish off in the spring, that's it. And uh, with movies, it was always a case of, well, the big budget movies start, you know, they might start around Christmas, uh, start around Thanksgiving, run through Christmas, and they go away again. They can start out, uh, and then they can start up again around Memorial Day, run through the summer. That seems to be changing. Is that, yeah, just, just a touch. It's dead. Uh, yeah. Take a look at when we released Hunger Games, it was March. And so, you know, that, that's over. I mean, you just have to find the right release date where you're not going to have the same demo. Yeah, being a, you know, everybody going after the same demo on the same weekend. Uh, television shows, binge, binge viewing is never going away. It is here to stay. It's because what consumers want, they want to watch their shows when they want to watch them, and they don't want anybody telling them that they have to have appointment viewing. That's here to stay, in my opinion. So, and so just to explain, even though people should get it, what does binge viewing actually mean? It means that when my wife and I had a new baby, and the new seasons of House of Cards is coming out. She watched every episode in three nights. 
And I will say, by the way, second season has a garden. I don't watch a lot of television. I, I thought binge was when you watched it all on the same day. I well, no, that well, was... well, I don't think you're watching it. <laughs> that's really binging. Yeah, no, but I mean, that's, uh, I, I will say that I don't watch a lot of television, but that first episode of House of Cards, second season, I'm not going to spoil it, I was shocked. So I almost felt, I, I literally had to, I said, I can't be seeing this right. <laughs> anyway, those of you that know House of Cards, the second season, it's a, it's an eye opener. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, for that, uh, that same thing apply in terms of it's you know, okay. If the uh, traditional element is dead, I mean, does that does that change the decision making process? In terms of, uh, does that mean that you need to have content all the time, or is there still sort of selectivity to that? Well, there has to be selectivity. Um, again, not all content is great, and you have to choose which content that we think will resonate with viewers and will have the most financial upside uh, through all its revenue streams. <coughs> like the traditional model, you know, was built in a, in a world in a, for historical reasons. A lot, and a lot of business practices that we have had in the past and still have to some degree uh, arise because of historical practice. And there was a reason for it when, it when it happened and now there's less of a reason for it. And I think as, you know, the digital, as new technologies come, come aboard and change viewing habits, change consumption patterns, and you know, have barriers to entry that fall because you know, more people can make content and, and all the rest and we're not gonna, new economic models rise, it naturally changes business practices, sometimes slowly uh, until all of a sudden it's quite fast. And I think, uh, you know, I agree with Michael, those models have by and large already shifted. And the, the old, going back to the old model. But the only player who drove that model specifically in television who we haven't discussed at all, who's the key, you know, lubrication of a lot of this system is the advertiser and the, the brands and how they really were the first to respond to digital delivery as it was about time shifting and fast forwarding. And I think that still is in place among the broadcasters and the uh, big media buying firms because of how the big corporate companies still acquire and build their marketing. And that element of it, I think, is ready for a next phase of innovation as well, and one that all of us will probably you know, be driving that conversation and that participation and finding ways to interconnect those worlds earlier so that all of these binge viewing, shifting, and adjustments can be rewarded back to the advertiser and not something that they fear. They're continually investing in traditional television and in traditional spots, but they're starting to grow what they can do around that. And that's going to be a, another phase of innovation that I, I have not yet seen. They have not driven as much as I would have expected, considering how much, at least over the broadcast system, leverage they have. Actually, it raises a question in terms of advertisers and uh, that Traditionally, advertisers still get the most bang for their buck, uh, just that, following uh, old, old style models, or at least that's where they seem to be spending most of their money. Uh, trying to leverage things in the digital space for advertisers and tie it in with the content, it's been a lot harder for them to, uh, even with all the metrics, to track the same number of eyeballs, to feel like they're getting the same amount of uh, return. You know, they're still willing to spend absurd amounts of money for the Super Bowl, even when some Super Bowl ad spaces don't sell until the last minute. How is that affecting things, do you think? I think it's good for our business. We're moving, uh, I, I'm not a, uh, well, look, we buy a lot of television because when you read the surveys, the people walk out of movie theaters and they say, well, where did you hear about it? A lot of, too many of them check the box at a television commercial. I don't even think it's true. And, uh, but I, I think that a certain number of people, they don't even know where they saw the trailer or where they saw the spot. Mm -hmm. But I think that you're, you're seeing you know, this pre-roll on, on digital. And I just think about when you, when you buy something in front of uh, uh, on YouTube on the, on the homepage, it's expensive, it's four or $500,000 for that, but that you, you know your audience is right there. And the idea that you know, in a world where you know it's C plus three and C plus seven, I, I have a whole issue with Nielsen. I won't go on a rant about that, but I just think it's <laughs> ridiculous. But the idea, uh, I just don't, I don't understand the whole C plus one, C plus three, which is all right. Well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna record your movie, your show, uh, well, okay, 
if, if you, how, why are we going to pay for, we should pay for C plus three, but is C plus three, is it real? Why are they recording at C plus one if they're going to record the show and they're going to watch it on that same day? This just doesn't, intuitively doesn't make much sense to me. So we're moving more toward digital where we actually can measure this, but TV is going to be around a long time. I think that you, you were kind of hinting around integration and all that, and maybe we end up going back to something like the old days, you're too young, Benny, to remember, but Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I think there's going to be more of that um, about these integration, and I think the advertisers have a tremendous amount of power, and they're going to start to um, to swing it around pretty good. Well, what's funny is that when when TV first started, uh, the advertisers were there front and center. You know, you Texaco Theater and things like that. So you think that that's going to actually start creeping back? I think there's something like that. I think that there's a lot of this branding that that, that can be done. And I think that, again, you're going to follow the eyeballs. The, 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 the reason that I think binge viewing is not going away is the portability. It's your, I think that, Stephen, you made the comment. It's like, my kids don't watch a television set. They think TV is the iPhone and the iPad and all of that. That's TV to them. So in the, the, if you can move this around, that changes the dynamics dramatically. I think it's already happening, actually. You don't have to, I mean, it's happening. It's, I think it, I agree that TV is a very valuable medium. And I think there'll be new models, or maybe old models, coming back into play. But if you look at, I mean, get, harken back to this maker acquisition that we that we just uh, did, part there, a big part of their economics are, are delivering uh, native advertising campaigns to advertisers, where the and it's, in short form it's a little easier because the the, nor, the, short, the native short form experience is of advertising length, so it's easy to create a an experience that's branded that's for a, an advertiser that looks and feels like the rest of the content on YouTube, but that's a good example of. A new model that's arising. Maker's very good at that. There are other makers, not the only one. And I think that native advertising, branded advertising, whatever, whatever you want to call it, where the content itself is um, looks like the other content, but is actually delivering an advertising message along with its entertainment value, I think is is happening online in a big way, and it's uh, something that we intend to participate in. We we made this deal with Defy Media. They own the Smosh channels, but they had this show that they launched last week, which was called Prank It Forward, <laughs> and it's very. I mean, it's. I don't know, 25 million views, I'm making that number up, I don't know what it is, but it's basically a really good thing, it's a prank forward for the deserving person, this waitress actually in some restaurant, and it was really well done. And then at the end, she effectively gets given a car. Very subtle, it's like that thing they did with Pepsi with that Jeff Gordon, with that, I don't know if you saw that, it was that, that's, that's fantastic advertising. We had this guy, we made a deal with this fellow by the name of uh, Freddie Wong, who's a um, uh, rocket jump, and He's got I don't know, 8 million YouTube subscribers, and he's got these crazy things he does. I mean, it's just a bunch of his pals, and they've got some special effects house, and he did this thing where he's got all these knives going around. So I promise you the next diversion that comes out, because knives are such an important part of that movie series, <laughs> Shailene will do something with him, and it'll be sort of a, basically an advertisement, but sort of fun. That's something that we hope can go virally. Uh, and I think that's a much more effective use of calling, spending $100,000 to do that than, frankly, buying a... I don't know how much is a TV spot on the on the Super Bowl now. You don't have four million dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, close to three million. Yeah. Although I still like live television. Yeah, the advertising. event space. But in in that regard, we are doing so much of that and have continued since I put the restaurant on. If anyone remembers that, twelve yep. years ago, funded by American Express, yeah. Coors, and Mitsubishi. And we are doing a, a show called Bet on Your Baby with ABC on Saturday nights with some big brand partners, including Procter and Gamble and Walmart, because they want more family programming. They wanted more co-viewing programming. And they wanted something that really celebrated achievement and, and kids. And that, um, and then we brought in another star from the ABC universe, Melissa Peterman, to be the host, who then is doing tweets and building out the social engagement and the platform connected to the brands and connected to the show. And you're seeing more and more lean in. And what's interesting is actually it's the biggest, most established marketers who are taking some of that risk because they have it in their own heritage that they did it. Procter and Gamble invented the soap opera. So they're <laughs> very comfortable leaning back into a market and a model that they helped pioneer. And it's just taking all the different constituents into the same room to embrace the concept from the creative team who's a little fearful to the advertising team who's a little aggressive to the broadcast channel who wants to ensure that they control that relationship. So all of that needs to kind of pull everyone together in order to keep the advertising base happy because they really underwrite those first seasons of Nashville along with you. So. 
Well, we're almost out of time, so I'd like to get for everybody, what's one thing to watch out for uh, over the next few years that you think is going to be most telling? Stephen, we'll start with you. I have no idea. I know the one, <laughs> the, 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 all, all I know is the one thing that we think we should watch out for won't be it. So, <laughs> uh, Well, it, since you're the person who understands risk probably as much as anybody, that's probably a good, uh, that either is a good sign or a scary sign. Uh -huh. Ben, do you have any thoughts? Donald Sterling is still the owner of the Clippers. Not for long. <laughs> I, I bet not for long. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll move away from that one, hopefully. <laughs> Kevin? I'm with Steve. The more you try to, it's unpredictable. Uh, I, I think that the next big thing is something that none of us can contemplate right now. We don't know what's happening, what it's going to be, but it's not going to be long until we, it becomes apparent. Got it. Michael? I don't have a crystal ball either, but I will say that you have to, you have to follow the money. And what I mean by that is if you, if you sort of look around the international marketplace and if you look at a company, for example, you look at any, any company that has a very significant market cap, um, and particularly in the digital world, and, and you take a look, for example, uh, and digital is a, is, a, is a big area. Take a look at China Mobile. China Mobile has a big, bigger market cap than Viacom, News Corp, Time Warner, and Disney combined. So you have these massive players, and take a look at the market cap of these. Uh, take a look at the market cap of, uh, you know, companies like Netflix. Take a look at the. You're, you're going to see, I believe, you're going to see these uh, 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 a marriage of sorts, or at least engagements in certain cases between content and distribution, and particularly on the digital front, because ultimately you want to be able to hedge your bets. And it, we we talk a lot, we've all been dancing around, you know, getting levered and leverage and all that. But I think you're going you're to see. Uh, more combinations of that to give, to give the, the joint venture partner, the combined companies, um, a, a heck of a lot more pricing flexibility and uh, the ability to make sure they don't get levered other places. That's what I think. Got it. So I'd like to say thank you very much to our distinguished panelists, and thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you, Kevin.